I'm, I'm Kostas and along with Damir, uh, we're going to present a few things around Move and uh, like what we do about security and cryptography in Move. I'm personally a co-founder and the chief cryptographer at uh, uh, like Miston Labs, uh, working on SUI now. Before I was at Facebook leading the cryptography team there for the uh, Novi and the Libra ecosystem. And before that, I was also at the blockchain company R3, working on the Corda blockchain. Also did a few uh, like things on uh, enclaves uh, using the Intel SGX and other stuff around security. And before that, I had uh, like a, a PhD on bilinear pairings uh, and things that are used now in zero knowledge proofs. Uh, Damir, if you want to take a moment to also mention about yourself, and then I can uh, move on to the slides. Yes, uh, my name is Damir. I am the author of, of the Move book and few <laughs> important packages around Move and like for the Move ecosystem. I started using this language in 2019, which is pretty, I mean, pretty far away from, from where we are now. And so by this time, I think I, I go as a move guy and probably have more experience with move than anyone. I mean, actual practical like coding experience with move than anyone else. Yeah, so that's me. Cool. So uh, I'll get started. Uh, by the way, a few of these slides are from our CTO, Sam. Uh, he recently presented um, uh, all of this work in, uh, in, a, in a related event, but we augmented it. So we have more examples here and some discussions around cryptography. Um, very quickly, um, the outline will be around like uh, why cryptography like blockchain need the safe asset oriented language. Uh, we're going to mention a few things about cryptography uh, that is used today in, in SUI and MOVE. And then we're going to combine, uh, we're going to mention how in MOVE uh, you can actually have like an object centric uh, data model. And at the very end, uh, how we can use this to, to scale. And uh, Damir will present a few real world examples on how you can actually code stuff on MOVE smart contracts. Um, so as, as we all know, the safety of our smart contract is super important for the safety of our assets. Uh, on the left side, we have like a few cases that uh, uh, have been quite popular. For example, the Roni network attack, uh, that there was like a validator issue there, like five out of nine keys uh, were actually exposed. Uh, we have another attack like the Poly network, wormhole, of course, uh, a few things around bridges, nomad bridge again. And all of these things, as you can uh, as you can expect, uh, sometimes are based on uh, like issues on like the smart contract logic. In some other cases, it's around key management. It's also around some weak primitives in some particular cases. So we had to actually create something uh, that we don't necessarily expect that contract developers will do better, and it will help them to actually do safe and secure programming for uh, for smart contracts. So at the same time, apart from the language, we also need two links. And these two links um, have to actually protect the users even from like accidental mistakes. I was personally like uh, a student of some uh, Udemy and uh, Coursera courses around Ethereum. And I remember when I finished this, I was back then at Facebook. I remember with my colleagues, uh, th there were a few examples like how to run a lottery on Ethereum. And then we realized, oh my God, this, this structure is actually uh, having some issues on the security side, and then you can break the lottery, and then you can break uh, a lot of the things that are happening there. Personally, I, I'm happy uh, that in the past I broke a lottery program, uh, literally stopped the ICO of a company doing decentralized lotteries on Ethereum. Uh, but since then, I moved to like more core cryptography there. But it was super, super easy to find bugs on, on Solidity, uh, especially if you're not uh, like security focused on and you're just implementing like, I don't know, Python and in blockchains. So we need safer languages and we also need testing and verification. Um, this is uh, our motto on how we're going to grow the dev community and why we believe Move is a better language compared to Solidity and all of the rest like Solana, Rust uh, based language and all of this. Um, <clears throat> so why why we have smart contracts and why they differ from traditional languages, right? So in smart contracts, we actually uh, require to define the asset types that we want to transact with. We have to have a mechanism to read, write, and transfer these assets. And obviously, we need some access control policies, especially the last one is something that is missing from all of the uh, like uh, modern languages before the blockchains. 
Um, and that's why you will see a few keywords uh, now, like uh, an asset has some dropping capabilities or some copy capabilities or uh, some other policies on how to react on this. Uh, that is not existing like in languages like Java and uh, like more higher level. Um, so we need safe abstractions. We're going to define custom assets. We're going to define ownership rules, access control uh, like mechanism. So strong isolation is a very, very important stuff. You will realize that uh, compared to Ethereum, that for example, everything is a U100, uh, 256 here. You can actually write source code that interacts directly with untrusted code written uh, uh, like by motivated attackers. But because we, we actually create all of this object into um, like uh, the, the real object we have in mind from traditional programming, you know exactly what you're expecting for. And um, this, is, this is why we have like uh, all of these smart contract languages, like blockchain languages. And even, for example, in Solana, they actually created a DSL where they restricted uh, uh, the, uh, the Rusty's, uh, let's say, approach in order to only provide API that can be deterministic enough for, uh, for this work. I personally did the same with Java. So in my previous, previous place before Facebook, I was also doing uh, like um, a clean version of Java where everything there was deterministic by removing all of the stuff from there. But it was a very, very painful approach. So the fact that at Facebook, we did move something from scratch without actually filtering out stuff, but putting all of the features that we need for blockchains, in my opinion, is a better approach. Um, so something that you cannot do uh, in other uh, languages, especially Ethereum and others, is you can pass an asset as an argument to a function or return one uh, from a function store an asset in a data structure, like an asset, when I say an asset, uh, literally an asset, not the U256, so you know exactly what this asset is. Um, borrow an asset, of course, even temporarily, or declare that an asset type from one contract can actually be used from different smart contracts, either outside the logic of the original author. And the this is very, very uh, important. How can we actually take an asset outside of the contract that created it? Imagine if, if you're trying to do something like this on Ethereum, it will be super, super complex, right? Because if you encode everything under the mindset that I want to compress everything on chain using uh, like U256 literally being a number, you have to have in mind, oh, I'm, I'm transferring something from one contract to the other, and then I have to know exactly the logic. Oh, this actually encoded a particular hash ID of something, or this is literally a, an integer value, a balance or this is something else. If there are no objects to define how this asset is controlled, it's very, very difficult and unsafe to, uh, to move assets around. And uh, the other thing is, if you go now to a like, very popular smart contract, I don't know, some lottery or something, the assets are literally locked in the code of the smart contract in, in the object, right? It's in a hash map there, you cannot extract them. And it's sometimes super difficult if you go to explorers and say, what assets do I own? And then the explorer should actually be able to look internally to the smart contract logic and see, oh, here is your reference that your uh, address is actually owning this particular thing. I had to know that um, uh, this particular hash map is storing references from owner to, uh, to the asset. And it's super difficult to actually generalize this. Um, so we believe that the assets, like an asset-centric model, is literally a fundamental building block. It's not only payments anymore on blockchains. And this is why we, we created Move. Um, so uh, something that is very important, at least for uh, companies like Axelar, uh, people br building bridges, and anything that has to do with cryptography. At the moment in SUI, we're supporting two schemes. Uh, you, can, you can easily take notes here. And these schemes are the pure ED25519, EDDSA, but the version uh, uh, like ZIP215, to, uh, to which is like the cofactor verification. There is a reason for this. The pure ED25519, and I was personally one of the authors that we figured out some of the attacks there, doesn't work well with uh, batch verification. And it is possible that someone using the non-primary uh, prime field of uh, like the ED25519 to actually confuse the batch verification to pass while the sequential wouldn't pass. And this is exactly the reason that we picked this particular version. Um, the other algorithm that we're supporting is the, the algorithm that is supported by Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, the ECDSA K1 curve. 
but we're actually using the non-malleable version. So we normalize the signatures because we need determinism in, in SUI. And we also support easy recover. Um, you will find it, this uh, super useful because if you're familiar with Ethereum signatures, now you can actually have pretty much the same uh, on uh, SUI. And if you want to use uh, ECDSA and you don't want to go to ED uh, to 5519, and you have again the same uh, logic of actually recovering your public key from uh, uh, from the signature and then verifying it against your address. Um, in the future, however, we're also going to add uh, some new schemes. Something that is on the roadmap is the R1 curve. There is a reason for this, and the reason is if you go to a like high-end device, Android or even iPhone latest versions, you will see that inside the mobile enclave there is no K1, there is no EDBSA. The only thing that exists is support for signing using NIST P1, like ECDSA R1. And this might open like a new, a completely new uh, like um, avenue for SUI to literally have mobile enclaves holding keys without mnemonics and without anything. Literally, your device is your key. And this key is not even now the private key to the owner itself. Um, and there is some uh, like uh, um, vision to have multisig, but it will be a restricted version of multisigs because as I said before, we need determinism in three. Um, the other thing is that on the validator signatures now, at the moment until today, we are still using the zip to 215, the same thing as the uh, account uh, uh, signatures with batch verification, of course, but we're switching and this will happen uh, literally in the next uh, couple of weeks to BLS 12 in order to have aggregation. The reason is, uh, because we're like uh, signature intense in uh, in SWE, we want to compress as much as the signatures as it is possible for the signatures to form uh, compressed certificates for the transactions. Um, so an important stuff that you need to know if you are working with SWE is how we're converting public keys to addresses. Uh, because we're supporting now agility, uh, obviously you have to add some flag and this is how it works. So we have for it DSA the zero flag that it defines that this is the key for it DSA, and they have and we have the one flag uh, uh, which is like for sec uh, two hundred fifty six k one. And the way the address is produced is you're putting the flag. It's literally one byte. Then you append the the public key, and this is how you're doing the uh, the hash of all of this stuff. So you know exactly that even if for some unknown reason an ECDSA key collides public key. Uh, uh, collides with an EDDSA public key, the hash address will be different. The SUI address will be different. And then at the moment, we are truncating this to 20 bytes, same as Ethereum. This is in contrast, by the way, with uh, Tendermint, where if you go to Tendermint, you will see my recent post here. What they do is the addresses for ED25519 is just the hash of the public key, again, truncated to 20. And there is also, even if you're using ECDSA, it's again the hassle of the public and again tracking to 20. So it is theoretically possible if someone finds it's theoretical, we don't have a proof, of course, but if you don't have a proof, uh, better you actually design it uh, differently. Ideally, you should have like a flag here. So even if you have like a public key of ECDSA or an EDDSA, the uh, output would be completely different. Um, and this is another important stuff. In SWE, you can literally verify an Ethereum signature internally to the smart contracts. We previously talked about the, the addresses of, of the users and the account, the account keys and the validator keys, but we have a very, very rich API on the smart contract level. We want to actually maintain it and uh, um, enhance it as much as we can. So you can verify an ED25519 signature. You can verify a SEC signature. You can literally verify a BLS signature inside the smart contract. You have EC recover in the smart contract. You have Ketsak 256 for compatibility with Ethereum. We also have, oh, something else that we have is you can even have bulletproofs, range proof inside uh, uh, SUI. Uh, you can even add Ristretto points. You can even create Pedersen commitments. So ideally, we're going to have very, very rich um, uh, API where people can build uh, more interesting protocols around cryptography. And this is something we believe it will be an advantage compared to the competition. And we gradually, we recently actually published Fast Crypto. Uh, it's a Rust API, which is a wrapper uh, of wisely selected um, uh, cryptographic libraries. And we also make enhancements on top of them. Um, I can show an example on how we do Ethereum signature verification. 
So here, uh, as you can see, this is like a PR that we're going to merge now. You're, uh, you're going to have all of the functionality you need to recover your keys and everything in, in Rust. It will be a native function that will be invoked by move. And this move function at the moment is called EC Recover F ETH address. So you can use it directly. I know a few people are working uh, to, to actually bring bridges on, on SWE. And this is actually one of the functions that you will find super useful. Um, so it's super easy. You can just have your oracles or anything to to actually uh, use the Ethereum type keys, and then they can easily be verified on on Sri. Um, so uh, when I mentioned before about the security stuff of uh, like assets internally, um, imagine that it's super important that we have functions that take as inputs object and they can also output objects if required. And we need the type here. So we have an example with a buy. If you give me a coin, literally I will give you a card title. It cannot be something else. How you do this on Ethereum, you have to uh, actually uh, change the, the way of uh, thinking because previously it will be a U256 here and another U256 here. And then I have to know, oh, it's uh, uh, this U256, it's an ID or the other one is a balance. Um, and the other thing is, obviously, you can you can even have references. Uh, you can even have like uh, by value and everything. All of this uh, that you can see in in these examples are user defined types declared in different modules. But it is possible because now they are defined in a in a module. But you know exactly uh, what are the rules that mandate the the logic behind this asset that will be used in a completely different uh, smart contract. So register, the function register might be a completely different module that takes as input card title, coin, coin is in a different module, card title is in a different module, and even kind of registration can, can be in a, in a different module, like this one that we uh, defined register. So all of the assets in SWE, unlike most of the blockchains, can literally flow across trust boundaries without losing integrity. Um, um, we have a few uh, like keywords to to protect uh, the uh, the functionality and and how the liabilities of each asset are defined. So, for instance, if something doesn't have like the copy uh, trait in in theory, you cannot you cannot copy it, right? I mean, you will see an error at the compilation time. I mean, while you're typing even at the CLI, you will see an error. Um, if you pass something by value, it's already passed, right? Uh, it's, it's moved. You cannot double spend it. You cannot literally use it twice here. And some some of them, some of the assets might not have the drop uh, like uh, capability, which means that if you try to drop something, if you try to delete, you cannot. And in this case, coin cannot be dropped, right? In, in this particular case, otherwise we could literally burn money. Um, so the the motto here is. We ensure in move that digital assets behave like physical ones, um, which is literally what, what you would expect from high level languages, um, uh, trying to avoid uh, like mistakes from the developers. Um, as I as explained before, this is how you define these uh, uh, this abilities, these capabilities here. So we can have like a struct, an object type, which has a copy uh, like function. It might have the drop function. It might have the key function. It might have the store function and it can also have uh, the store, sorry, the store capability. And it can also have, uh, no, I mean, it can be like a hot potato uh, uh, like situation here where you don't have any uh, any abilities. Um, I think I can, uh, after this, I can move to uh, to, to Damir, but the, the benefit with move is platform agnostic. Yes, Sui is using it, but as you can see here, it's not only Sui using it, right? It's also Aptos, Zero L, Starcoin, and many others that uh, can I can take advantage of move. So it's probably the first language that is uh, literally designed for blockchains, but not necessarily for uh, like our Sui or all of the other uh, uh, like other blockchains that they want to 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 migrate. It's anyone can can literally use it to do um, asset oriented uh, stuff. It can be blockchain. It can even be like another payment system. Uh, but yeah, we handle all of the cryptography, uh, serialization, account formats. This can can be generalized as well. It's it's like uh, it's like a language literally built for all of the blockchain community rather than uh, like particular projects. Um, uh, and this is one of the reasons that we expect that tooling and libraries uh, will be involved. 
and when we receive sometimes the the question oh how how can someone learn uh, learn move but move is like a generic language now right everyone can reuse it which means that tools and uh, we already have some uh, like plugins for some of the most popular um uh, uh, let's say uh tools that you can actually write code ids and uh, we expect that because there are so many companies now dealing with this, plus some other companies want to deal with this, uh, the, the move actually adapts it with Flaris. Damir, uh, up to you. Uh, can you go to the next one? Yeah. Um, as, as, as Costa said, I mean, the move focuses on security and I mean, basically on security uh, of, of, of everything that's inside the VM, because we're talking about assets for which we need to make sure that there are guarantees that they will never like, discard it, copy it, or drop. And so whenever we, we deal with an asset, uh, we are, I mean, we have guarantees by the VM that this asset is secure. Um, so to, to provide, I mean, to, to, to add additional uh, I mean, additional security measures for that are things like static verification for the VM. So this is like a thing we can write as pack that this function actually does in the bytecode what it does in the source language. Um, all every feature of the language has. I mean, we don't have dynamic dispatch. Sorry, uh, we don't have dynamic dispatch and. If compiler tells you that this code compiles, then it compiles and it will work as expected. So we don't have interfaces for this reason because we can't have anything defined in the runtime. And like, if you have a dependency for your module, it has to be pre done I mean, you have it has to exist before you publish something. So we don't have this like weak, um, weak guarantees or like expectations that something will work. We have to have it statically uh before we actually compile the code uh so, so move vm compiles to be uh to to the bytecode we have like the bytecode language you can actually write programs in the bytecode language so, but move is like the high level source language for that and we have additional bytecode ver verification phases where we make sure that assets are not lost and also in the in the bytecode Oh yeah, I have to say that assets are a thing in the bytecode. So whenever some struct has some ability, which is like it, it cannot be dropped or it can be stored, all of this, all of these features are enforced on the bytecode level. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, yes, uh, regarding formal verification, we have this tool called Move Prover. It's ongoing work. Um, it started back in DM, where we're now continuing to work. I mean, we continue to work in that direction. Uh, Move Prover is a tool that allows you to write packs for your code to make sure that it does what it does. Um, all, all of the features, yes, of the standard library are verified and true. And right now it's all open source and we are as a company and also Aptos and other folks from different companies are helping us uh, finalize the work on the prover. Um, next slide, please. So we actually have a small mix up of slides. Um, we're slowly moving towards like what we move actually brings to the table as compared to DM move. And the only difference between these two is storage. So. In move, I mean, first of all, move has account based uh, model, which, which means that like every asset is stored under an account. In core move, you can have one, one asset or like one, yes, one asset of one type stored under one account. So you can't have like two coins, but you can have balance of coins. And so th this example clear, uh, shows how, um, how it's usually implemented in core move. Like we have a centralized table, which has an assets, uh, like <laughs> keyed by token ID and inside we have a call asset for every, for every type of assets, like for every table we'll have like a different storage. It is important because move is move highly relies on types and like is indexed by types actually. Um, and so it takes a lot of code in a centralized fashion to, to actually write like some storage and it does not provide you any guarantees about like what actually happens inside inside the smart contract even though you know that you are operating assets 
the assets are centralized. And so whenever you call some function, you need to trust the module that you're calling to, <clears throat> uh, uh, so, you're, so you can send your assets and trust this contract <clears throat> with them, sorry. Uh, can we go to the next one? Uh, so if you, uh, with, with Sweet Move, we actually re, re, redone the storage part of Move. So we don't allow people to define their storage. I think that's, that's a very harsh definition, but we, we created this free, uh, free, free ways of storing assets. We, we added an own one, which you see here. If there is an asset and we transfer it to account, it's actually being transferred and no one can access it. And we, and, and objects have their owner field. So whenever, I mean, so like if there is a coin in the system, it has an owner field, which, and this coin can only be accessed by its owner, by, I mean, who is written for, I mean, who is set as an owner for this asset. And we also have a notion of shared objects, which we will get to because this clearly does not allow access, I mean, multi-party access. Um, but what's important, right? I mean, in, at this slide, like as I said, right here, is that ever, uh, we re we redone the storage part of, um, of move and we added objects which have their IDs and their and they have owners. Yeah, let's go to the next slide, please. Costas, you sure you want to give this one to me? I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the way storage is organized is that we have this map of object IDs and objects. So basically, like every object is stored somewhere and it has an ID and an owner field. Um, we, can, uh, we can find any object by its ID. So they're explorable in, in Sweet Explorer, in the wallet. You can actually like query an object by ID. It can be anything, literally, because like by object, we mean asset, which was defined as a struct with the capability. Um, as, as, I, as I said, as I already said, every object has ownership metadata, which can be, I mean, an owner can be either shared, uh, either address of a user, I mean, of an account, or another object. Every, every transaction that you send, I think, yeah, well, let's go here. No, because can you go to the previous one? Because it's important. So when, when you pass something, I mean, when you pass object as an argument to a transaction, so like an entry function, entry function, um, you pass it by ID. So when, when you call it like in the CLI or somewhere else, you actually specify which objects you are working on as opposed to core move where you call a function and you expect it to do what, I mean, uh, anything with the assets that are controlled by a module that defines them. Yes, now we can go to the next one. Um, so ownership of the object, like O in this example can have like, um, yes, can be either address, which is account address or another object, or it can be shared. Shared effectively means that anyone can access a shared object. And so there is no, no literal owner and all the access controls have to be implemented by, um, by the developer of the module or like by creator of the module. And so module defines access control rules for the shared object. Um, oh yeah, it literally has this example. So we have entry functions. Entry functions are functions that can be called from outside of the blockchain. And depending on how we actually specify this argument, I mean, whether it's a, an owned like full value, whether it's a mutable uh, reference or whether it's a reference, we know from the function signature what, what the function can do. Of course, like if it can consume, then we transfer our ownership to this function and it does it can do anything with it. If it's a mutable reference, we keep the ownership, but it can mutate with, a, with an immutable reference. We can use NFT authorization, like we show I own this, but I don't give it to you which is extremely useful in the scenarios where you need to prove ownership of something or uh, so-called capabilities where admin is not because his address is written somewhere in the contract, but because he holds an admin capability, which he shows to perform admin actions. And that means that if, that, if like ownership, if the proof of ownership is an asset, I can, for example, transfer it to Costas and now he is an admin of my marketplace. This also means that we can have generic implementations for marketplaces 
and we can have like as many marketplaces and as many uh, capabilities to to actually manage these marketplaces. Um, I already mentioned about IDs, yeah. So since I, I, I mentioned that we actually pass an asset and it is possible by looking at the function signature, even wallet can do it and like move bytecode is deserializable. Uh, a wallet can ask you like, this is a function uh, send gift or oh, like receive gift. Are you sure that you want to send all your coins and all your NFTs into that? Um, so, I mean, the language is built in a way that we always know what's going to happen in a function and we only trust this function with what we actually pass into it. So that's one of the core, uh, one of the main features of screen move. Um, next one. I can take it from here. Um, so there is a very interesting uh, uh, like uh, benefit of SRI where there is, uh, we actually have three three different types of uh, like operations uh, on the smart contract. Someone can even avoid consensus. And how would you do that, right? If you have owned object, something that you own and you know exactly how to do your ordering in your uh, like wallet or uh, like in your application logic, you don't necessarily need the, the consensus to order your transactions. You can literally send the transactions independently. And because it's you that you are owning stuff, you're 100% sure that you're going actually to uh, to pin uh, to the to the validators for we, from whom you expect the signatures. They just giving you signatures and then you can form a certificate that, hey, these guys agreed to, to sign this transaction. Um, and this is actually possible. Uh, and we do like an extension of the fast pay protocol and uh, all of the like transactions like payments and other systems can actually happen on parallel i can explain i can give a thorough list of uh, what is possible to uh, to happen with uh, uh, and which application can take benefit of this on the other side on the on the right side we have cases where you literally need a shared object for example you have an atomic swap or you have like an exchange we have to go there and actually request uh, uh, someone who will do like the bid and buy and all of this situation you literally need the table where you're going to have like a common uh, point of reference in order to have like an atomic swap there an atomic transaction and in these particular cases you need full consensus we call uh, this object shared objects now and what is a shared object in the uh, uh, like in the language of ethereum anything that uh, you would expect to be like uh, held by some uh, hash map or a list or any collection inside the contract this is literally the shared object uh, but what we did is obviously the assets can even escape the, the shared object. But if you want to put them in the same hash map because you need an atomic swap or something, there you need a full consensus. You need full ordering here. Uh, but the nice thing is you might have different shared objects, like there is a uh, an exchange uh, smart contract and then there is a, another smart contract that is doing, I don't know, e-voting or something. This can actually uh, exec be executed on parallel. Because now you are not actually focusing on the same uh, uh, like point of congestion, and you can literally uh, parallelize all of the transactions that are reaching one or the other. So inside each shared object, you have to do it sequentially. So you need full consensus between transactions of different shared objects. You can actually parallelize that stuff, and there is a huge benefit of uh, of SWIFT here. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, I can get. I can go more. There is a huge benefit on sequential uh, bottleneck. There might be some very, very popular um, um, uh, smart contracts out there, and you don't need to delay the whole network because of this. Now, anything else will continue to be executed without actually uh, taking the sequential resources of the validators. The validators, especially on transactions that uh, uh, are not requiring full consensus, can literally scale um, uh, linearly, which is super useful, right? You don't need full consensus now. You don't need to wait for other objects to happen. And if you need to wait, you can actually do this uh, like intra uh, internal sharding uh, between the shared objects, and you can you can have like a better and more scalable system uh, all the way. Um, as I explained before, this is like the most important stuff. Sequential bottlenecks is when you're touching the same shared object by removing all of the assets as like in contrast to Ethereum outside the, the hash map of uh, like the 
um, the collection of a smart contract, we can actually enable parallelization here. Um, and also you can even, this can even affect like the gas price, right? Not something else that is super popular can, can make our, uh, like other transactions be in a, in a limbo and they have to wait and all of this stuff, which means that we have like a by far better uh, gas system compared to uh, most of the other blockchains. Um, so as I explained before, because we have objects versions, we also allow the parallel execution. In this particular example on the left, we have like two transactions. They are sending uh, like two different objects. One is evolving the, this object to like a different version. Uh, it might be an NFT where you mutate it, for example. There is another one that it does the same and all of them can be executed on parallel. When we say core, it can even be in a different machine. And then you have like cases where there is a set object and in this shared object, uh, you're actually using uh, the IDX, which is like the, the shared object here. Um, and we have to sequence the transaction because they're touching the same um, uh, asset. Um, it's very, very important to understand what transactions can actually be used uh, for single writer. I, we have the list. I mean, if you type single writer friendly applications, who can actually avoid full consensus, right? Regular peer-to-peer -peer payments. You go to Starbucks, you don't need to wait to form a block. You're, you're just receiving uh, uh, 2F plus one signatures and Starbucks can serve your coffee. Um, it's also confidential transactions. We can extend these with all of the abilities we explained before with bulletproofs, Pedersen commitments and everything uh, to actually have some confidential transactions for, for different assets. Bulletproofs and all of this can be used for other stuff, right? I mean, the purpose is not confidential transactions necessarily. You can use you can do for KYC, you can do for, for, for different stuff. But one of the applications is definitely single writer friendly for anything that has to do with public bulletin board. Um, imagine you want to store files, you want to store links, uh, metadata. Why do you want to order these transactions between themselves? When I'm changing my website and Sergey is also changing their website, we don't need to coordinate, right? We can do in parallel, nobody will stop us from doing this stuff. And this is exactly what we're expecting from a modern blockchain language. So for this particular case, I own my website. I'm the author of the website. Sergey is the author of uh, his website. And then we can actually run the transactions independently without waiting for me if I have a heavy transaction for the transaction to complete until his transaction enters the chain and then there is a sequence of events. Um, another interesting part is proof of existence. It's very, very similar to the above. Uh, but for timestamp documents. So imagine, um, I don't know, there might be someone who can predict other soccer outcomes or basketball outcomes. You can uh, you can even uh, put your uh, like uh, prediction there and you can prove later on, hey, my prediction was before the match uh, finishes and all of this stuff. And you can uh, do the same thing with uh, published and reveal. You can even make your prediction in a hidden form and then you can reveal it. Uh, but in all of these particular cases, it's something that you own. You don't need to have like full consensus. You can have a single writer. Um, then there are obviously private uh, decentralized repositories. You can have with some encryption, encrypted NFTs and other stuff. Um, a lot of like companies are now using the, the blockchain to upload uh, like uh, curriculums, uh, university degrees, repositories. And you can have like um, uh, very low fees here because you don't, you are not affected by the, the traffic on the, on the rest of the blockchain. Um, messaging service apps. I mean, we even have an example on how you can do decentralized Twitter with SWE with 50 lines of code. It's super easy because what is a tweet, right? It's an NFT. And because it's an NFT that you own, oh, you don't need consensus anymore, right? It's my, my tweet. The only thing that can happen is other people will probably retweet or like, but what they need is the ID reference, nothing else. Um, private messaging, obviously you can have an encrypted Twitter, which goes to WhatsApp or Signal. Then you can actually have the, the same for blog platforms ratings. I mean, a Yelp or a TripAdvisor and Sui would be like a, a super cool idea. You can have personal GitHub, uh, Wish, shopping list and everything. Um, it's, it's very important that a lot of people are using it for non-interactive games. Uh, for example, you can have a SimCity, you own everything. You're not interacting with someone. You don't need a shared object. You can actually have this on uh, single writer transactions. Um, even human versus computer games. So I personally work uh, on a chess example, for example, where uh, I can play with Sui, right? The, the logic on Sui will, will be like internally to the contract. And many people can create this human to Sui games. And uh, this will work automatically without uh, requiring to have like a shared object here. 
uh, coupons and tickets, and you can issue as many tickets as you want, airdrops, mass meetings. In general, even, even some mixed protocols, for example, it is possible to combine, and this is something super interesting, to combine shared objects with single writer objects. For example, in a lottery, what you can do, I can buy a ticket in a single writer format, and then um, we all submit our tickets independently. And at the end of the day, we have to declare the winner. The declaration of the winner can be a shared object. I propose that, hey, my ticket won the lottery. And then if nobody complains, then I won the ticket. So you can even do fraud proofs uh, and combine the single writer with uh, like the shared object, something which is new to the industry. Uh, we're we're uh, going to publish all of these uh, like cool applications very soon. So there are many things, even for, for DEXs, you can have like the price codes from oracles to be sent in a single writer format, but then the aggregation and the trading of the users is a shared object because now you need an atomic swap. Uh, but price codes, so, but the oracles can literally work in a, in a fashion where they don't wait for anything. Um, so this is, this is some of the cool things that you can do. I mean, it's seamless to the user. If you are using a shared object, uh, obviously you should know that your application has to go uh, through consensus. And I feel that a lot of people who are joining like the SUI uh, programming language coming from Ethereum, they are slightly changing mentality. Oh, uh, now maybe for this application, I can take advantage of single writer. So I need to, to encode the application differently. Nobody stops you from doing the same thing with Ethereum. Everyone can literally have uh, everything under a shared object, even avoid having NFTs for their assets. But this is not giving you the advantages you can get from SWE. So whenever possible, you can actually uh, uh, encode your application differently to achieve lowest fees, lower fees, and uh, uh, sometimes even uh, like faster finality and all of this stuff. But even if you go to finality, we have one of the fastest um, uh, consensus schemes out there, Nargol and Pulsar at the moment. Um, something which is very important, and especially for uh, like companies uh, like you, uh, is we introduce also the concept of sparse nodes. So what's happening now is most blockchains have the archival nodes, the full nodes, and obviously the validator nodes. And there are some light client nodes. Sparse nodes is literally a full node. But there is the only difference here is because now you can track your assets independently, there are object IDs per assets. It's a full node only for your assets. And this can allow actually people running their own full node for their own assets uh, without requiring to download everything from the validators and syncing up with other blockchain uh, full nodes and so on. So we expect that this decoupling of the asset outside the smart contract storage Will, uh, will, uh, will support this easier uh, like uh, transaction object relationship and will actually save you money eventually because a lot of people are going to have full nodes that are literally full nodes uh, without having to download everything. Um, yeah, and uh, this is a TLDR uh, and then we will proceed with some examples from, from Damir. Uh, obviously moves move because of uh, like being uh, uh, designed for, for a better like solidity and even better than Solana's uh, DSL and all of this stuff. Uh, we believe it's safer. Uh, it's providing convenient uh, convenient abstractions and we work with assets, especially on Sui move. And our model make the dependencies explicit, of course, you know exactly what you're referring to. This can help in many different uh, like ways. One of them, as Damir mentioned, is safer wallets you know exactly what types you're you're attaching, right? On Ethereum, you need to know the logic of what you're attaching. So the wallet need to encode what the U256 means in each contract. So it's so difficult there and you cannot generalize it. We, ma we can maximize parallelism even if you don't go um, to on the fast lane of uh, like parallel transactions and you need full consensus. We literally have uh, uh, one of the fastest consensus out there, uh, one of them that has also uh, won a best paper award, and we can even uh, allow intravalidator sharding uh, using different shared objects running in different cores. This is totally uh, acceptable. And we discuss contention, of course, by object-based fee markets, and eventually this resulted in cheaper uh, ledger validation with the sparse nodes. Um, these are a few links that you can use, and this is actually the best part of the of the presentation. Tamir will give you real examples with Move. 
Uh, I personally let it move through that. So I did, I literally implemented Twitter without reading the documentation. <laughs> uh, let's let's do that. Um, yeah, I think you can go, yeah, here. So so we'll we'll go through three types of ownership and move. First one is the single owner objects. Basically, as soon as you define, like here we have the struct Elden Ring, as soon as you add key to something and you like specify the first the first field of it as UID, it becomes an asset. And what it means is that it's freely transferable, shareable. It can be it can be freezed uh, somewhere on the network and like placed for everyone to see and use or like reference. Uh, and so the only thing, uh, I mean, the, the basic operation that we can do with an asset, like the single owner thing is transferring assets. So for that, we use we transfer module and we, we pass the, the asset into, into the transfer transfer function, we specify a recipient and that's it. I mean, in the background and like what hap what actually happens <laughs> is that we receive all signatures and then we just change the owner field from, from myself to cost this again or to someone else. Uh, every time the transfer was called. Uh, transfer can only be done, performed by the module that defines the type, unless the type has store, but I think we'll get to it. So as a second type, the second type of ownership and actually placing objects in the system is freezing objects. It's one of the like most underrated ones and we're still trying to figure out like the best use cases for that. For example, like submitting results of a lottery. <laughs> as Costa suggested, but I, I love this one for configurations. For example, we can make sure that, I mean, we can, uh, we can have a proof that some configuration was provided by the module on a blockchain. So whenever we like see objects of this type, we can have additional description in a wallet or an explorer. So like in this example, we publish a wallet configuration uh, object right in the module initializer. Module initializer is a function that is called once on the mo on module publish. So like we publish it, it's called and no one can call it ever again. So here we, we freeze an object and what, what happens afterwards is that this object becomes available to everyone as a mutable reference. It is something like a const value on chain. It doesn't have a version. I mean, it has its first version or like whenever you decide to freeze it, but then its version doesn't get bumped, never. And so the third, the third type of ownership, or not only, yes, ownership, it's a shared object. Uh, here we have two slides actually cost us, but let's start with this one. So shared object is an object that can be accessed by everyone. To make this example more generic, I mean, this counter example, anyone can create a counter. So whenever someone calls like a create, they share an object counter. And so on, on the network it, uh, appears a new counter object which can be accessed by anyone, including mutably. And so let's jump to the next one. Um, and so since, I mean, since once counter is published, we can use the same interface to interact with all with any counter that is published. I mean, that is placed, that is effectively shared on the network. So like anyone in this function can increment any counter they pass into this function. To do so, I would find the counter I want to increment and I would call a function increment and pass its object ID. And I mean, additional sec security, I mean, security control is defined by the module and here we see the function set value which can only be performed by the owner of the counter by a person who published this specific counter and so um, even though shared objects can be accessed mutably by everyone its module can decide or can define a policy uh, according to which a, uh, an object can be modified or accessed i mean accessed by everyone but modified not um, let's go to the next one um, uh, we, we mentioned that an object can have um, an address as, as an owner, like I own something, but it's also possible for an object to be owned by another object. So basically we can have like a hero in this example, which is a generic character that you can use. I mean, like basically your avatar, like a PlayStation account or some account, which you, which you can use in different games. So we create it, we transfer, transfer it to ourselves and we have a known object hero in this case. Uh, click on the next one, please. <clears throat> and so we have this function, which is called transfer to object. 
and we can we can pass our hero i mean we can pass an object and our hero to this function to touch another any generic object t to this to this hero so what it means is that here we'll have child objects for example i don't know a sword from the fighters arena or academy award from i don't know uh, movies or some other dm and it allows for non-heterogeneous collections which means that we don't i mean this t can be any so so here can own like a car uh, here can own uh, a sword and here can own a hat so so here it becomes like the parent of this object to remove an object from another object you can you have to have a mutable reference to this one i mean to the to the parent object so to remove an item we have to pass a hero uh, we pass an item because we still can access on the blockchain and we get it uh, as a return value of this function and since it's move as it has to go somewhere so i mean since we got the, the t in remove item we have to transfer it somewhere we have to share it or we have to do something about it but it's, it's no longer the responsibility of the hero module let's go to the next one <clears throat> so as as i mentioned we have three three models it's a known object a shared object and a frozen object uh immutable object uh i mean some people call it and so with own version uh, i mean old objects uh are a perfect fit for whenever we need to have strong like absolute ownership of something and also the max amount of parallelization because we can do anything with our own objects in parallel with anyone doing the same or different thing with their own objects so ideal application is of course coin or a capability when i um when i authorize my actions somewhere a shared object um, is usually something like whenever something needs to be accessed by multi parties, it's always shared object. That's like rule of thumb and sweet. And so, for example, if we were to build a marketplace on the network, which would have listings, we'll get to the marketplace example in a bit. It has to be, it, just by nature, it has to be a shared object with listings. So we go, we access this marketplace object, we pay some coin, we get what, what we want to purchase. And finally, the immutable objects. I still believe that they're more like utility something, but we'll figure out if there's like a better use. It, usually it's something that, that either is like a permanent constant configuration or when we open to the world some capability, for example, so everyone can use it now because we like give everyone access to something. Um, so... <clears throat> We already talked about um, like access to shared objects. I personally prefer to explain it as like every shared object is a mini blockchain, uh, as as in like it has its own gas matrix and it has its own sequence and and works in parallel like to other shared objects. And so if we had a centralized marketplace, all transactions say we have a thousand transactions would go to a centralized to one to one address, and the sequence of these transactions, of course, would be like a thousand um, um, I mean its length is going to be a thousand and everyone has to wait for everyone but since we give developers the tool the tool set such as like using I mean allowing them to share to use shared objects in as many as many uh, in any way possible an author of the marketplace can actually split different categories of items if they decide to or like different NFTs traded on this on this platform, or they can shard however they want this marketplace, so they so they scale. So like Apes takes only like one third of all transactions, and Punks takes one third, or whatever number. I mean, whatever uh, the requirement for that is. Uh, let's go to the next one. So, Coin. Um, oh, can we can we do the next one first? Yeah, it's funny. So coin is a type in move, uh, in, in swing move in, on our platform, and it has a balance inside. Balance is basically like a value with U64 inside. So we can roughly say that one coin with 100 is like an NFT and an object. And we can also have multiple coins. Like I can have one with 100, I can have another with like 200, and each one of them is gonna be an object. There are rules 
um, which allow us, I mean, in like functions that allow us to merge coins or split coins or to split a million, uh, a coin worth of a million into a million different pieces and send them in parallel to a million different addresses. We can do that. Uh, not sure about the million, we have limited transaction size, but something like that is definitely achievable. achievable. And so we also have the treasury cap. Treasury cap is an object that allows uh, bearer to mint, uh, mint and burn coins. Uh, in like decentralized applications and liquidity pools, it's usually put inside a shared object. So uh, like the, there's some, some logic around it, but if someone just creates some coin to send to some friends, like BFF coin or something like that, uh, they are free to mint and burn coins as, as much as they want uh, to the previous one. Thanks. And so um, due to generic nature of move and due to us uh, doing our job in uh, making these interfaces as simple as possible, uh, a new coin publish is as simple as just like calling this function with uh, a newly created type. So in this, in this module publish, we define a type my coin and um, we accept it as a, as a first argument in the init function, which is called one time witness. And, and then we, we use this one time witness to initialize coin create currency. And as a result, uh, the publisher of the module will, will get his um, treasury cap, which he can then use to mint new coins and then coins become owned objects and then he can send them. Um, so getting, getting to the marketplace example. Marketplace is usually like canonical implementation of a marketplace right now is having a one or multiple shared objects with listings. Listings are like the specific listing with an item with the generic item T. It doesn't have to be of the same type. And listings are usually uh, placed, uh, I mean, or like owned by the marketplace. So like we have a marketplace with kitties, we have like a thousand listings with kitties which are children to the marketplace. Uh, the next one. So to implement that, we basically need to first share the marketplace object. Uh, I mean, define its ID. We don't even need to have anything in it really. Um, next one. Um, and so if someone wants to list something, they would they would uh, supply an item. I mean, like some some, asset T, which has a key plus store, a combination of abilities which allows it to be an asset and plus it can be wrapped into another, I mean, other assets. And so we create a listing where we put an item, we put a price tag, we specify an owner and we transfer it to objects. So now our marketplace is now a parent to listings. So if we go to Explorer and we check like all, all listings of this marketplace, it will, it will be relatively easy for us to discover everything that's listed on this marketplace. I mean, additionally, we can use events to get even more information in a better discoverable way of chain. Yep. And so to purchase it, uh, we will reference the marketplace object, but it won't be used because the only, the only reason for us to reference marketplace object is, is so we can get access to its children. And in this function, I mean, to purchase something, we would use the parent marketplace. We would specify the listing we want to uh, purchase or like acquire. And we, we send a coin, uh, in this case, it's coins we, which we want to pay for this listing. Then we do, then we basically destroy listing, uh, check the price and then transfer, um, transfer what's been paid to owner and return an asset. To, to the user who actually wanted to purchase something. I, I'm not sure if it's ever mentioned anywhere, but like move is fully transactional. <laughs> so we can destroy something, we can do all the important logic and we can put asserts in the very end. So it's, it's a right to, to, to mess up uh, the asserts logic and all the checks that are required for some operations. Um, I think that's it for me, Costas. Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's that's, that's that's everything, right? This is the last slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, we we use the whole the whole hour, guys. We we know that, but yeah, we uh, I'm personally free for a few questions if you're up to. Awesome. Well, yeah. First of all, thanks, guys, for walking through this. I think this is super super helpful. Um, yeah. If anybody has any questions, I have I guess one question or 
I have many questions, but uh, one question. Uh, so, I mean, move is like the the language, but you you know you mentioned like it's sort of pretty portable, right? So underneath it, what's got, what's happening? Is there like a you know VM that um, like different projects integrate, or like what does the runtime actually look like to that makes it like portable? Well, first of all, uh, I, I mean, I can partially answer this question. First of all, like Move is a VM and it's called Move VM and like EVM <laughs> uh, because EVM is, is so specific to Ethereum, but like Move VM is because it targets like just Move. And we can we can actually like treat Move VM as sort of like a function where we supply like the current state, we're passing all the arguments and then we get the right sets as a result. And then we can do whatever we want with them. So like, for example, in, in 2019, I was working on a project where we were implementing Move VM for Cosmos because it, it basically didn't matter what, I mean, where we port the VM. We, I mean, at, at this time we had to fork it. And so we would like spin it up uh, we would pass arguments, we would get the result from VM use it, using it as a black box where we supply just state and, and the input data. And then we would use write sets, uh, the results in write operations on the state uh, over the data. I mean, in a way that we wanted it. Hope this answers your question. Oh, uh, and also right now, um, Move has, I mean, it's, it's a big step up. Uh, Move supports adapters. So adapters is a way to integrate custom functionality such as like custom native functions or the way something is treated or a new native type into the VM. So you can have advanced functionality and you can tune it to your needs. For example, I'm not sure if tables are in the move core, but I believe like Apsos were the first to add that to their adapter. Uh, and we, for example, like we also have our like SWE adapter and we turn SWE move into like the core move. And so it gets executed inside. Cool. I guess another question. So I guess like when it comes to objects, right? Uh, maybe it wasn't just quite clear. So are you guys defining all of these like core objects uh, and it gets shipped with, you know, um, with SWE itself or like, is there a way for a developer to add, you know, different types of objects? And I guess like what happens if you, you know, if you actually need to change, right, uh, kind of some interfaces or like semantics of an object or like guarantees with it, is that kind of consensus upgrade or is that the kind of upgrade to the move itself or how does that look like? Um, so, yeah, go for, for, for the object is, uh, it's very straightforward answer, right? I mean, you can define your own objects, of course. I mean, if you want to create uh, cats and dogs and all of the types of NFTs and new coins that you want, you can you can go and create them. There will be a few objects that we define, like for example, coin, which is like the uh, uh, like the stack that we we can provide here, that is maintained by the uh, the move ecosystem, and obviously there will be some voting process for upgrades and anything required there. But for the custom operations, it's up to the developer to define their their own types. Right, nobody stops them from creating new objects. And so like, okay, so you have, you said you have coin, are you gonna have like other types of assets, like, you know, NFTs of the world and like things like that or? Uh, uh, as I, yeah. Yeah, as I, I mentioned, think. as I mentioned before, at, at least uh, I can even go like to cryptography and all of this stuff, right? We have Ristretto Point, for example, it's a struct. There will be a few things uh, out there to help you actually implementing stuff. And at the same time, we, we allow uh, like any flexibility for the users to do their own. But there will be there will be a few. I don't know if um, we have examples, uh, but uh, I know Damir uh, might also be familiar with other types that might be super useful for for development. Um, usually, people mean two things when they talk about blockchain smart contracts. They usually mean NFTs and coins. I mean, like here's a twenty and here's a seven twenty one. De facto, became standards for the industry. And our response to ERC20 is a coin module, which is built into the SWIFT framework, which anyone can instantiate trade to their custom type, which is guaranteed to be the same as SWIFT coin or any other coin on the network. So this is like the same guarantee that we provide for everyone to, through the standard library. And we simplify this process. So you don't need to re-implement, you don't need to re reinvent, reinvent the wheel uh, to actually have a new coin type added. Um, but with NFTs, 
it's a it's a completely different uh, type of like discussion because since everything on Sui is is already an NFT in a way because it has a unique identifier, it is non-fungible, but there are like different ways you can work with these NFTs. We don't have anything right now to like offer to broader public because we don't see um, a point why we would actually constrain someone and give them some some um, so, some built inside because they can actually build their own. We can create a generic like start standard or something, but we would keep the details of implementation, how this object behaves, whether it can be transferred, whether it's always shared or it's always owned, or whether it's an own that can become shared, or whether it's like a logical ownership on a shared object where you have an owner field on a shared object and you manage the access to this object. So it's everything is up to developers to decide what they what they see like more natural for them. Um, but we, we, we do have like built-in types. We did not add new built-ins. Like we still have vector of any type and that's the most complicated uh, native type that we have in the system. So everything else is structs. Yes, any questions from the team? Yeah, I have a uh, maybe boring non-technical question, but uh, given you know how new this language is and how unfamiliar the majority of Web3 developers that are building in Solidity are, are you guys expecting um, you know uh, kind of long on-ramp for development on the chain once you guys reach mainnet? And if not, do you guys have like specific kind of programs in place that you feel that are unique to support developers that are looking to build a move? I can take this one, right? As a cryptographer, honestly, how much time did it take me to write the Twitter thing? Like 20 minutes or 30 minutes? I will say that people who are familiar with high level languages, especially doing objects, they might even find it easier to jump to, to move compared to Solidity, which is like more untyped and uh, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, the things that we're working on, apart from all of the common uh, stuff like uh, uh, having like some uh, uh, like marathons, hackings, and all of this stuff that where we can bring people together, we will work under the mentality of learn by example. So we're going to port a lot of the most popular, most of the most popular um, um, smart contracts out there, even on Solana, Ethereum, and all of the other uh, uh, like blockchains to SUI and move, and we're going to create it to create matrices for comparisons as uh, like Damir did. Actually, Damir started all of this led by example in, in SWE, which we believe it's it's by far different approach. And I can tell you for sure that I met personally with developers who didn't read the line of code in the documentation. They start from the examples and this is how they onboard to the, to the system. The second thing is uh, I personally use C Lion, for example, as an editor, right? And there is also VS Code and all of this stuff. There is already uh, a plugin to to be able to write and compile move and write move uh, which means that uh, this is already happening and the fact that it's not only one uh, like company that is building uh, SWE, uh, sorry move uh, and it's also another five uh, companies and some others are also exploring it the community is even broader than that right it's not only us focusing on bringing people from from ethereum uh, or solana to move and there are uh, in my opinion, something that is starting happening is that a few PhD students and some other uh, like researchers who are actually comparing the languages between themselves. Uh, and at the moment, the, the benefits seem to actually favor move at least on uh, robustness, security and other things. And it doesn't feel so uh, like complex and uh, so difficult to actually have a ramp up from uh, like Ethereum or higher level languages to move. We're going to follow all of the things that other people are doing. We're going to, to work on, on tooling, especially plugins, ID, support, and all of this stuff. Learn by example, we believe we will be like uh, one of the most uh, significant uh, like benefits of what we have to offer. And we're building a very, very solid, um, uh, I mean, at least as Misten, um, uh, like dev relations team and people who are going to help other partners to build stuff. Right. We understand that it might be uh, like a bit of uh, 
uh, a requirement to actually learn a new language, but at the same time, you shouldn't feel like the number of Ethereum users is, is large, right? It might be a few thousand, but Java is millions of users. And then if you if you get all of these extra people into something that they're they're feeling more familiar with, especially the Rust community and the other community which is bigger than Ethereum, uh, we believe we have like a good chance to to actually uh, have talent working on new stuff on on Move. Helpful. Thank you guys. You guys are in incentivized testnet right now. Is that right? Yes, we're in the process of actually publishing the testnet. We're we're still DevNet and uh, pre-testnet stuff, and there will be testnet announcements in in a while. Is there an updated ETA for mainnet? I think uh, last we had spoke uh, October, but is that looking aggressive now? I think uh, this this all depends on uh, like uh, engineering criteria compared to having specific deadlines as we 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 did have. Obviously, we're getting feedback from DevNet and uh, like pre-testnet and partners, and I think there will be clarification in in the upcoming weeks for this. Sounds good. Thanks. But yeah, generally, if you have ideas on what smart contracts you want to see how they would look like in, in Sui Move, we're super happy. We literally have a team to, to accommodate this. Awesome. Sounds good. Anything else? I guess I have uh, maybe a last question. Um, you mentioned about DCDSA R1, right? And like, you know, you can use like a phone. Um, yeah, the identifier, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, uh, but I, I don't know how the enclave like implemented. How do you do recovery in that case? If you, you that's, have to that's, do, like, multi that's a very that's a very good question. First, it, it will probably be accompanied with multisig, and yeah. you might you might have something like written on a paper, and then you're using your phone, or you might have multiple devices, and then if you lose all of the devices, obviously there is a problem. But also, I, I don't know if you know that myself and Sam, especially the CTO. Are also the authors of the kilos protection uh, mechanism. I don't know if you if you've seen it. It's the only method that even if you lose your key, there is a way to actually get back your account under certain circumstances. I think this is the only post event solution in the industry at the moment. It's called kilos protection. Um, uh, it's it's like kelp, like the the plant in the in the ocean, and uh, we're planning to actually have some very very cool. Um, uh, like ways of recovering accounts, even if you lose your private key. Cool. All right. Well, nothing else. I think, yeah, thank you guys so much for uh, for joining us and uh, walking through this. This is um, super exciting. And yeah, looking forward to kind of continuing the, the integration. Great. Uh, and if you need any help, I know Damir is also on this, uh, on, on how to not mock anymore the Ethereum verification and all of this stuff. We're super happy to help here. Awesome. Thank all you. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks guys. everyone. Good to see you again. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.